Hello, I'm Chris Matherall, I'm the botanical recorder for North Northumberland where I'm sitting and uh, this is the fifth film that the Natural History Society have asked me to make about local plants and today it's a lovely sunny day, it must be in the late 20s the temperature and what better thing to do than sit with your feet in the water on a nice stream um, and examining some water plants and next to me I've got watercress, it's difficult to imagine more appropriate water plant to start with. Um, of course you can see that it's got small white flowers, it's a SWF, um, and they're in uh, a cross shape and that tells you immediately that it's one of the cabbage family, the Brassicaceae or Cruciferae. Um, it's uh, called a nasturtium in Latin, nasturtium officinale. It's been out in and out of various other genera in its career but it's now settled in nasturtium. Of course it's widely cultivated, uh, if you go down to the parts of the south of England they have huge watercress beds um, where they harvest it and send it off packed in plastic to Sainsbury's. And um, you'll know already from the name officinale uh, that it's got some sort of medicinal use. Um, the office being the original apothecary shop and uh, of course um, this is uh, a very important plant for, uh, uh, for getting vitamin C which uh, is, uh, is, is very healthy. Um, it comes in various sorts, we won't worry about that, um, even back in the uh, 17th and 18th century um, gardeners realised that there was more than one sort of watercress but um, because they all tasted the same they weren't too worried and um, there are two or three different sorts growing in the UK but uh, they all look more or less the same and they all taste more or less the same and they're all more or less as good if you're going to eat them in your salad. So watercress Nasturtium officinale. Now you can probably just see next to me that there's a, a blue plant and um, I know that there's more of it behind me so I'm going to wander over there and we'll have a look at this plant which is one of a group of plants that we, uh, we haven't seen any of yet. Now you don't need a botanist to tell you that this is a forget-me-not. They are uh, very uh, beautiful flowers, bright blue usually, um, occasionally you get creamy white ones but mostly they're bright blue with a lovely yellow uh, centre. And um, there are quite a few of them in the UK, uh, there are two common plants that grow out in woodland and field edges and so forth and then there are three relatively common ones that grow mm, sometimes with their feet in water or in very damp places and this is one of those. This is the water forget-me-not, Myosotis scorpioides and uh, you can see it's quite a big plant, um, it's got quite large flowers and um, although there are three different ones um, this is by far the largest, the others tend to be slightly smaller and there's a very easy way of telling that you've got uh, Myosotis scorpioides because if I pull off one of the flowers behind it it's got a, a green um, calyx and if I look in the calyx I can see firstly that the hairs on the outside look like somebody's got a tin of Brill cream and slapped it all over the surface, they're sticking on the surface of the, of the little green calyx and that tells me it's one of these watery ones as if I didn't know because the water's slowly creeping into my boots as I speak and uh, if I look inside I can see the style, the female part of the section apparatus and it's very long, it's as long as the uh, the tip of the, the tips of the calyx and that tells me that this is water forget-me-not Myosotis scorpioides. It's quite a bonny plant, if I had a pond in my garden I'd grow this, it's uh, really nice. Why forget-me-not? Well actually it's continental, um, it was called scorpion grass originally and um, it was, uh, it was a German myth or story about um, a knight falling into uh, a river and throwing um, this plant which he had in his hand to his beloved who was on the bank saying don't forget me not, don't forget me, except he said it in German and I can't do that and um, uh, we adopted the name um, 
So the original English name was scorpion grass, but we always now call it forget-me-not. Well, I'm standing next to a very large plant now. This is hemlock water dropwort, Oenanthe cricata in Latin, and the very name tells you that it's a dodgy plant. <laughs> hemlock, you know hemlock's poisonous, very poisonous, and in fact hemlock water dropwort is even more poisonous. It's probably one of our most poisonous UK plants. All parts of the plant are. Um, you can see it's an umbellifer. It has uh, these umbels of small, tiny little white flowers in clusters. The flowers are asymmetric, um, petals are different sizes. It has um, uh, hollow stems which are very strongly grooved, finely divided leaves. It's quite an obvious plant. It usually grows by stream sides and slightly wet, damp places. And um, it's uh, a plant which even today does claim a few lives each year because the, the tubers, which look a bit like parsnips, and I'm told taste quite like parsnips, although I haven't tried it and I don't suggest you do, um, are occasionally found by campers. They, wa they, they, uh, they wash out on the sides of the streams and you see these lovely parsnips sitting on the side of the river and you think, oh, those must be tasty, and by golly they are, I and mean, then you wish that you hadn't. Um, and it does claim usually a few lives every year. So this is a plant to avoid having too much contact with. I shall wash my hands after I've fiddled with this one. This is Hemlock Water Dropwort, Oenanthe Cricata. Well, I'm just checking on this Russian comfrey. It's another big plant and um, it's on a, bit of, a little bit of a bank, but it's still a chunky, chunky fellow. And, um, this is says Russian comfrey, Symphytum ex uplandicum, and the X tells you it's a hybrid. And maybe that's why it's so large, it's got hybrid vigour. And um, although it's not native, um, it's become our commonest comfrey. Uh, we have various native ones, but this one has overtaken them all. And it, as you can see, it has purple, purpley flowers, and not always quite the shade of purple, but this is very common. It looks slightly tatty, slightly dirty sort of colour, I always think. Um, but what I was checking on uh, it was the calyx tube. That's the little green structure behind the tubular flower. And if you look at them under a hand lens, you can see that they have teeth. And um, those teeth are very um, important when telling which one of these comfries you've got. Um, and in this one, as you might expect from a hybrid, although I don't know whether it's anything to do with actually with the hybridity, um, the teeth are different sizes. Now some of them are even asymmetric, so they have one long side and then the next has a little jag and then another long one. So the teeth so the teeth are asymmetric and that's typical of Russian comfrey. All the other ones have various shaped teeth, but they're all even. Um, it needs to go to an orthodontist. Um, uh, it's a member of the borage family, uh, related to forget-me-not, which we saw earlier on, and uh, so it has rather rough hairs, and you'll remember I said in the previous video that some people might be a bit allergic to the hairs, so be careful uh, what you do. Um, the, um, the leaves, apparently, are really good to eat uh, in Germany. I don't know it's necessarily this one, it might be another comfrey, but in Germany they make them into fritters. They put them in batter, fry them, and they're delicious, apparently. I must try that. Um, but of course, what it's really well known for is as um, uh, to put in your uh, water butt. Um, you put a you know, big load in your water butt and um, it rots down. It absolutely stinks, but it's fantastic for growing tomatoes. If you water your tomatoes with uh, comfrey water, it's brilliant. Beats tomoride any day. So this is Russian comfrey, a hybrid comfrey, Symphytum ex uplandicum. Well, here I am, sitting in a ditch next to the pond, with one of our most recognisable uh, pond age plants, wetland plants. This is Ragged Robin, which I'm sure you've seen before. Uh, Lychnis, no, not Lychnis, Silene Flosculi. Used to be Lychnis until a couple of years ago, and then the taxonomists decided that it was more closely related to uh, Red Campion than we thought. And so it's now in the same genus as Red Campion, which is Silene dioica. And it's also pink, but otherwise it doesn't look much like Red Campion because it's got these petals which are very finely divided. 
it's got five of them, but they are split uh, almost down to the base, certainly into two, sometimes fours, threes. Uh, it's got uh, the same flower structure as uh, Red Campion, uh, because it's in the same, same genus now. So it has five petals, but they're joined into a tube at the bottom, and the calyx is also a tube. Uh, with five points on it, uh, ten anthers and five stamens. But unlike red camping, you can see that the leaves are very, very narrow, and this is a wet and specialist. It's a plant that likes to have its feet very damp, not necessarily in water, as mine are at the moment, but uh, it likes to be in damp places. Um, so when you see this plant, you know that if you're walking towards it, you need to uh, take a little bit of care because it's likely to get a little bit damper the closer you get. So this is Silene Flosculli, Ragged Robin. Well, this is a wetland plant which you will, I am sure, have seen before, although you may not have known what it was. This is meadow sweet Philopendula ulmaria. Ulmaria means um, that it has leaves that look a bit like elm leaves. Well, maybe a bit like elm leaves. Um, it's a member of the rose family, and so if you look at it carefully, you'll see that it's got a great number of uh, anthers on long filaments. And uh, so it's, it's related to the roses that we grow in our garden, um, but not very closely. Um, the leaves, as you can see, are pinnate, and these side leaves are the ones that are supposed to look like elm trees. But the thing about the leaves, which I suspect hardly anybody ever looks at, including very experienced botanists, are that although you see the large leaves, but there are on the stem, the centre stem, tiny little leaves. They're only three millimetres long, two millimetres long, and they're all down the central stem on each one. And I bet if you ask most experienced botanists, they'll never have seen those. And they're actually really rather nice, they're rather sweet. It's called meadow sweet um, because it does have a very sweet smell. Some people think it's a bit sickly. No, I actually rather like it. I think it's very nice. It's very honey sweet smell. Um, but the name is in fact a mistake. <laughs> well, the English name is a mistake. Uh, because its old English name was mead sweat, which means um, uh, it's used for sweetening mead. And um, somebody in the 16th century thought mead must be meadow, because mead isn't the name for meadow, and so it got its English name of meadow sweet. But in fact, it, its name comes from the fact that it was so sweet, so much nectar in it, that it was used for sweetening mead in the Middle Ages. So this is meadow sweet Philopendula ulmaria. Well, our last flower today, and for this week, is the yellow flag, known in Northumberland, where we are, as a seg. Not quite sure why it's called a seg. It's not a very nice name, but what's a lovely, lovely plant. This is one of our only two native irises. Um, the other one is, uh, this is Iris pseudocorus. Iris in Greek means rainbow. And you'll know that irises come in all sorts of colours. Say, our flag iris, which is the one that likes to have its feet in water, uh, is always yellow. And uh, it has very flat leaves. Not all irises have flat leaves, but uh, this one does. And it has what looks like quite a complicated flower head. But if you get close to it and have a good look, it's actually quite simple. You have three flowers with a large lip at the bottom, the, the two, which is called a fall in, uh, in iris terminology. And then underneath the top lip, you have the uh, stigma and the stamens. And then you have these two little side petals. And interestingly, the yellow flag is a plant in the UK which has almost the most nectar in it, but one, one other which has even more. And so you'll see bees getting right down inside the, inside the plant, get to the nectar, and of course they get the pollen from the anthers on their backs and off they go and pollinate another plant. Um, so it's, it has a huge amount of nectar, so it's very, very popular with bees. Um, and uh, it it's almost always grows in uh, with its feet in water. Uh, this is Iris pseudocorus. 
the rainbow plant, yellow flag in English.